And now for the first keynote of our conference today. Um, and we're really privileged to have with us Dr. Jennifer Dixon, who's been the chief executive at the Health Foundation for over four years now. Jennifer comes with a wonderful pedigree and experience in the field of health and healthcare. Um, prior to the Health Foundation, she worked at the King's Fund, and previous to that, she was a policy advisor to the chief executive of the NHS in England. So we've asked Jennifer to come and help us think about uh, our new ambition, as Marie just mentioned. Our goal being to improve quality of life and improve the health of the population. And we've asked Jennifer to help us think about that this morning. Jennifer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much, Amar. I'm really uh, thrilled to be here. Uh, I don't know if you know, but you're really famous, uh, this particular trust, uh, because you're so energetic. You, you're very much on the map for quality improvement work around the country, and I think you're a real beacon. Uh, so congratulations so far on your journey. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm not as exciting as the beats uh, are, uh, but I have to say, um, I went to see Hamilton uh, about 18 months ago, and I don't know if you've seen that rap musical yet, uh, but I was so inspired by that that I came back and did a rap to the staff. <laughs> and they haven't let me forget it. Um, so, but I won't inflict that on you today, I rest assured. Uh, so there we are. So let's um, have a go and um, uh, at a few things. So um, what Amar asked me to talk about is uh, the contribution of healthcare and the role of improvement approaches to make progress on population health. Now, this is such a difficult question. Thank you, Emma, really. Uh, and I have to say, we at the Health Foundation, although we've spent the last 10 years, I think, um, looking at quality improvement and supporting it around the National Health Service, uh, we're really just in the foothills of think thinking how it's going to apply to improve the population health, the kind of population that you see day in, day out. Uh, so if you'll forgive me, this is a kind of um, early thoughts and groping towards a kind of method. So, but I hear you're in the same position too, so maybe that's not too bad after all. Uh, the first thing I just want to say one or two words about health itself, because uh, clearly in your dealings with um, patients and your populations, you will see a whole set of issues and it will th you will think, uh, there's a whole set of issues behind these health issues. Uh, how do we even begin to start to think about this? But I just wanted to show you one or two slides that I found quite helpful on the health side. Um, uh, and what this shows you is the, um, the life expectancy of people in different uh, groups of 10. So there are 10 groups along the bottom. And the group at the bottom there is, is, are those living in the most deprived areas in England. Um, and the top one is those who are living in the least deprived area. And across the um, y-axis is, is the age of death. The blue column is, is what age you are when you die. And you can see there is a little difference between the, those living in the, in the most deprived areas and those living in the rich areas. But the biggest difference is that red um, bar, and the red bar shows you how long you live in healthy life uh, before you start getting sick. Um, and what it shows is that those people, these are women actually in, in, in um, England, um, uh, they show you that uh, the age of, uh, when you start to become ill, in, if you're in the most deprived area, you're 52. That's the average sort of start off where you start getting stuff happening. Uh, but it's um, 20 years later, more or less, for those who are living in the least deprived areas. So there's a huge, huge gap here, um, socioeconomically, across the country, that there is an opportunity here to make a difference. And a lot of that gap there is uh, multi-morbidity, people with lots of different types of diseases and these are clusters uh, of conditions. And depression actually is one big element of that, actually. It's about as the single biggest element of these disease clusters. Um, the other opportunity is um, looking at, well, what causes most death and disability combined across the UK now? And this is some data. For those of you who are data geeks, you might want to look at the site of the Institute for Health Metrics and 
uh, evaluation, which is funded by the Gates Foundation. And this does fantastic work across all countries and does lots of data visualizations. And what this shows you is what's causing the most death and disability over 10 years between 2005 and 2015. And what you show is what we normally had thought of, or at least in 2005, as being the top killers and the top causes of illness. Heart disease, low back pain, um, lung cancer, cerebrovascular disease, COPD. Um, really, they've declined over the last decade or so. And instead, more neurological conditions are coming to the fore as being a big weight of disease. Um, sense organ diseases, that's really neurological conditions, but Alzheimer's, depressive disorders, and so on. So you're seeing a sort of rise in that, probably to do with ageing. So a big, big opportunity. And then what the institute, the same institute said, well, if those are the mm, conditions that people have, what are the risk factors underneath those? And there's two ways of thinking about risk factors. What are the kind of bodily risk factors and what are the wider determinants of health with risk factors, stuff that happens out in the community? And on the sort of more bodily sort of medical sort of risk factors, of course, it's tobacco, which is the big risk factor, dietary risks, um, blood pressure, obesity, alcohol use, and so on. What this doesn't really describe is what's behind that, and what's behind that could be a whole set of things. Again, you will see in your work, possibly, stress, poor work, poor housing, family breakup, and so on, uh, and may maybe adverse child experiences that have led into a shadow into, into causing ill health. So, so lots of... I just thought that might help orientate you into a few uh, sort of... Um, areas of, of ill health and what might be driving it. So what do you then try and do about it? Well, um, this is, um, I think, a slightly blurry slide. But what I think this shows is that um, a lot of, what a lot of people are doing at the moment is saying, this is the population we serve, or this is, this is, the, this is the area that we serve, the, the, the population area. Um, let's kind of slice up that population according to their risk of disease. Um, and, uh, and so people have used various tools to stratify the risk, it's called risk stratification, and uh, chunk up the population in order to then think about them separately. So at the high end, you've got people with uh, active disease who are extremely high risk, and that's estimated, it depends uh, how you, w what tool you use, but say that's two to three percent, roughly. This is illustrative. Then you've got those people with chronic disease who have acute exacerbations, but can be managed at home. Uh, they're about, uh, roughly about five to fifteen percent. Then you've got a wider group of people who aren't sick, nevertheless, but they're really at risk. Um, uh, maybe people who are just approaching the age fifty-two in that previous graph, uh, and they're about a quarter of the population, say. And then you've got anything between 40 and 60 percent. As I say, these are illustrative. A larger group of people who are really at low risk, maybe because they're a lot younger, um, and, and, and so on. So if you can chunk up the population in this way, and using the data that we have, we've got fantastic data in the National Health Service, then we can kind of identify these groups. And of course, those at the right end side of the spectrum, the higher risk costs a great deal. Uh, and those at the lower end cost less, but are much more amenable to preventive um, primary prevention. Um, but what we don't know, even if you do chunk the population up like that, we don't know the individuals in each of those groups who might be amenable to preventive care in some way. And this has got to do not 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 this this is this is because there are some things you can't spot on data, such as personality types, such as how activated or motivated a person is to improve their own health. So you, you so the data will take you so far, but you really do then have to understand your population, you have to go and talk to them, do market research, and all sorts of things to work out how impactable, how, how, what sort of things you can do to help. Um, and then of course. Um, uh, the ones that you, you will see a lot of in your work will be those that you have active management, maybe those that are amenable to secondary prevention, but it's these groups on the left-hand side that maybe you don't see uh, uh, who are amenable to primary prevention, uh, and, and, the, and that's the opportunity that I think we're talking about today. 
Uh, and of course, it, that's just another way of putting it at the top there. People on this side of the spectrum you see in healthcare, they turn up at your door uh, or they're in the community, but those at the other end of the spectrum don't, and therefore they're more susceptible to wider determinants of health. Housing bothers them, not healthcare. Uh, Okay, um, those of you who do know uh, about a lot about the foundation, uh, my foundation, um, knows that we've moved quite a lot recently into looking at wider determinants of health, and we've been putting out quite a few series of infographics that some of you may find useful in your work, and one of them is what makes us healthy, and I think there's a kind of consensus, it's not hard evidence, but it's a consensus based on evidence that as little of, of our, the population's well-being uh, as 10% is, is really contributed to by health care, health services. Uh, 10 to 20% is the usual figure that you see banded around, which means that the other 80 to 90% is really because of these other things, as you'd expect, and the way we live our lives. Good work, good surroundings, how much money you've got, what your housing's like, education level that you've got, um, do you get on with your friends and families? Are you isolated? Transportation, food, and so on. And these sorts of things are helping to contribute to that, that, that um, gap in life expectancy I showed earlier. So, you, so all sorts of factors here. And other ways you see this demonstrated or written down are these kinds of a sort of um, rainbow maps, if you like, or horizon maps where you've got... Um, the, in, the patient in red and then their behavioural factors and then their networks and then a whole range of living conditions and so on. So this is just another way of, 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 of saying what the previous slide said. So a lot, of, a lot of things and a lot of scope for intervention, but quite a dizzying array. And some people have um, even gone so far as started to map this out. So those of you who do a lot of QI, I presume a lot of you here will be doing driver diagrams, trying to work out what influences what. But um, there are, you, what you s often see with people who are trying to um, influence health, you see very complicated diagrams. In fact, they look like this. Uh, they're, they're not a simple clinical pathway, it's a, it's a complete mess, actually. And this was uh, one report, I think this was from Guys and St Thomas's Foundation, on obesity, uh, ha the factors that influence obesity. And uh, although you won't be able to see that because it's all very blurred, they tried to shade certain areas that certain agencies might have a chance of influencing. <laughs> So healthcare there is in that blue sort of L-shaped blob at the bottom, like tiny, um, and then the media is over there and local authority and education is somewhere else. Um, so what factors are involved? Um, the multiple agencies involved, the dynamic nature of these, how these things interact is, is just, you, you, you'll, you'll be forgiven for saying, well, let's just go home and stick to healthcare because it's, uh, it's less uh, confusing. Um, so that's what the task is on our plate if we really want to try and affect upstream um, health. So what I'm just going to do next is just say a few words um, about this um, middle bit here where, you're, where people are at risk or they've got some chronic condition where they are at risk of acute exacerbation, um, but they may be in the, living happily in the community most of the time. Um, so what can we do to really boost efforts in those in that direction? Uh, I'm just going to st start off not by talking about quality improvement because it's, uh, I'm talking about now wider policy, if you don't mind for a minute. And I really do think um, that um, the five-year forward view here is, is a great um, framing for trying to corral policy to prod the system to be more um, active in thinking about that, that particular population group, um, the chronic and the at-risk. And the kind of external prods, now this is my, uh, my previous world when I was a policy analyst, so, so outside of the um, providers and the uh, trusts that y many of you work, there are people in the national level who are designing financial incentives in the system, they're designing regulation, how the CQC works, 
Um, they're designing targets and plans and performance management, all the things that you hear about and can probably experience. Um, and the, the kind of combination and blend of those can, can help to push or at least encourage the system to be more active in looking at population health. And actually, there's been quite a few steps forward, I think, with a five-year forward view to prevent ill health. So, for example, um, there's the NHS constitution, the NHS mandate, new models of care in the five-year forward view, investment in primary care mental health, a lot of work on diabetes, and also a lot of work on food sold in hospitals. You probably read recently that uh, NHS England uh, last year ordered hospitals to remove supersized chocolate bars and grab bags of sugary snacks off the shelves uh, in their um, uh, forecourts, which they have done, and there's been some good uh, results at, uh, as a result. So one hospital claimed to have sold fewer, uh, 1.1 million pounds fewer chocolate bars in the last year, for example. So all these things matter. Um, and I do think this move towards um, more place-based models of care um, and to encourage um, organisations to collaborate within STPs, um, sustainability and transformation partnerships, plans, uh, and these new um, integrated care organisations and accountable care organisations. I know it's a dizzying set of models, but really I think the emphasis here is on collaboration, not competition. Um, to work together because uh, so that their care is integrated and actually you can then work upstream. So I think a lot of very positive things happening as well as initiatives such as make every contact count. Every time you see a patient, if you've got the time that is, to, to uh, understand a little bit more about their health and help with um, smoking or at least direct them with uh, if they have some risk factors. So I think the, 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 the long story cutting it short is that I think there's been a more favourable external environment um, coming out of policy than there has been for some time to improve prevention. Uh, set alongside that are cuts to public health, though, so that has to be put part in part of the picture. Um, I just want to say a little word here about um, some of the new models of care, because some of them really are working very hard, and it's worth tracking their developments. Um, we are evaluating some of these, and one of them I want to draw your attention to, which has been very effective, is, re is simply um, boosting primary care within care homes for older people. And as a result of just that, manu that manoeuvre, really boosting and, uh, uh, and being much more proactive in primary care, um, they managed to reduce uh, emergency admissions by 23%. So that's a good result. Um, and um, so that's Principia in Rushcliffe up in North uh, Nottingham uh, was one example. And there are others also coming off the pipeline. So worth keeping. Now, are they using quality improvement te techniques? No, not really. Not formally, anyway, not what they're calling. Uh, what they're just doing is doing some really obvious things, like saying, instead of having uh, 10 GPs uh, serve this social care home, we'll have two who really know the individuals and who understand the complexities of people in this particular risk group. Um, so very interesting, some new models of care. Um, and then there are many others coming down the track. Uh, and many of you will know those, the GP federations being another. And there's a lot of learning going on with these new care models about how they are trying to make change, work with many partners in order to try to improve care and work towards population health. Many of you know Don Berwick, there he is. Uh, and there's a whole set of resources that some of you will have seen on the NHS England's website. As well as Don Berwick, there are a few organisations helping, and I wanted to put um, um, some information up about that. This is very busy, but just to say, and I have no contact with them, otherwise I'm, I'm not plugging them, but the Dartmouth Institute um, are busy, sorry, um, helping some of these new models uh, work to improve population health, and they have developed something called a place-based care network program as well, where they're working with STPs now to try to improve population health. So there are groups around uh, busily doing that quite successfully and using some quality improvement techniques to do that. 
Um, so just for a minute, I'll just go right upstream now to the area where people are quite healthy or they're um, just at risk but not really appearing in the healthcare system. And here I just want to let you know of a few things that we are doing at the Health Foundation because it might help you in your work and you can reach out to us and look at the resources we've got available. So the Health Foundation really up until about two years ago was really the Healthcare Foundation. We were really just trying to improve quality of care, but now we're trying to get into this area that I'm just talking about and uh, making lots of grants available as well as doing lots of research. So have a look at, and there's lots of um, facilities, resources on our website to have a look at and grants to apply for as well. Um, and I just wanted to let you know the kind of four things we're doing. Uh, we're fir we're firstly, we are trying to look at how the, uh, this is with respect to the NHS's role in, in improving health. Firstly, we're trying to support the NHS to get better at prevention through grants, um, through grants to places, to institutions and looking at individuals as well. Um, we are also supporting the NHS to focus on the context of the individual and wider social determinants. And we're doing a lot of work here with data analytics to do better risk stratification. And we're funding a whole lot of work on behavioural insights to see where nudges, economic nudges, can help to um, support individuals to live healthier lives. Um, we're doing quite a lot how the NHS itself as an, as an, as an employer and as an institution in, a, in, a, in an area can mobilise more of its assets to work with other stakeholders to improve care and improve health. Um, and for example, how the NHS can use some of its buildings better, how it, uh, it can club together with the police, with fire, with local authorities and use uh, financial and other assets and, um, to pool them for, for health purposes. And that's work we've been doing with somebody called the Democracy Collaborative that's very interesting. And then finally, <coughs> we, uh, which is more your area, I think the area you're interested in, is trying to implement improvement method approaches to improve health. And we're in the foothills of that, um, but what we have done is we've got quite a few projects we've funded, and also we've mobilised a network, some of you will have heard about, a network of 2,000 people across the UK in the Q community. And the Q community are people interested in QI and want to develop it further. They're networking with each other and they have formed special interest groups. Um, is this Q? Oops, sorry. This is Q. Two, as I say, 2,000 people and they have come together in, in special interest groups and one of them is improving population health. So here's some information that's on our website about that and there are several projects that they are pursuing that you could have a look at. Um, to try to um, um, to try to improve population health, and we have regular WebExes as well. But I think probably one of the best examples of using quality improvement techniques, which we haven't funded, by the way, this is now across the UK, is um, the work that Jason Leach would have talked about last year. I think is that right? Two two years ago. Um, this is too much to read, so don't do that. But what, what they are doing is they are... Jason Leach is the National Clinical Director in, up in the NHS Scotland, uh, Clinical Director of Clinical Healthcare and um, Quality. And he are they are trying to apply quality improvement methods across the government and broader public sector uh, to build out from the Scottish Patient Safety Programme. Um, and they have got... Um, an improvement collaborative going called the Early Years Collaborative. IHI are very much behind this, so there's, there's, there's very familiar techniques that they are using, such as the Breakthrough Collaborative, and, and they've expanded this into Children and Young People's Improvement Collaborative, and are, and are tackling a range of things in that very busy diagram that I, that I showed you earlier, that, that complex diagram, whether it's smoking cessation in pregnant mothers, whether it's reading to children to try to bond the parents to the children more and so on. And um, so they're really being quite active about this uh, and, as I say, being helped by IHI. But I think the two messages that the Scots say coming to this um, um, from safety are... Um, spread, um, um, use, um, use the broad principles of quality uh, improvement. Don't use a slavishly any one method. Um, and empower frontline staff and service users. All the stuff that you're doing 
um, but um, just be guided by your own improvements and, and, and your, uh, but don't slavishly use any one approach because this is a very complex area as, as drawn. So I think that's quite a key method, but the Scottish example I think is the best so far across the country. Um, we um, know that um, context is very important in healthcare, not, so it's even more important in the so social determinants of health. And then going back to this um, population again, uh, as I say, they're low risk. I think our conclusion so far at the foundation is that what you need to do probably to try to work out from safety and um, um, healthcare improvement into health is to really use a blend of approaches. And as you know, there's a variety of ones that people use. There's the more classic model for improvement, plan, do, study, act. There's all sorts of new ways of systematically thinking about designing services involving patients, of course. There's behavioral insights that you can be using. There's mapping pathways and, and using flow techniques to try to lean a pathway. There are big rooms to involve multi-agencies and there's, obviously there's a big uh, role in community um, organising and developing. So identify your populations, get under their skin, work with partners and use a range of tools in order to move forward. But I think the other message from Scotland is try not to boil the ocean with gazillions of metrics. Just try and use ones that are doable and manageable. Even if you think you're eating the elephant in small chunks, just start somewhere. So I think that's probably our, our main message. Um, and I've, I'm going to, I've just got, finally got a, just a few slides here, um, just to give you a few examples of what's happening uh, elsewhere and a few from the United States. Um, but firstly, um, I think there's some very interesting moves afoot um, at Imperial, um, particularly in paediatrics, where they are using a very interesting approach to population health management. And I'm showing you this because I think they're the data and how they are visualizing information to try and understand how high risk people are is, is very interesting. So this is a asthma radar screen where they have individual level information about patients and they basically map when the patient touches the system, more or less in real time, as I understand it. So they can see at a glance that the patient is, a, is, is turning up in, in A&E, in casualty, in in, in um, outpatients uh, and so on, and perhaps in Tower Hamlets, you can also do that, of course, for primary care. And this, at a glance, can then help you understand who might be uh, increasing their frequency of visits and therefore might be at high re risk so that they're not missed in the system. And the system is organised so it does alert individuals um, who, in the healthcare system for, for patients at this high risk. Um, here's a bit more in, 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 in close. So this is a timeline and this shows you where, for one patient, where they touch the system and uh, what for. And this shows you over time, they're clearly having quite an episode over the period of February to August, the six month period in, in uh, last year. Now, if you don't do this, then it's very, very difficult to track patients' movements and understand what's happening. But this is, this is so this is a, a dashboard that they've now been using to great effect. So Imperial, I think, is worth having a look at. That's Bob Kleber and colleagues at Imperial. Um, at uh, IHI, clearly IHI are very experienced in this arena. I don't need to tell you that. You know them extremely well. But they are applying the triple aim to population health. And uh, again, they, they have used a variety of techniques, a lot in the website, based on risk stratification and using tool, a blend of tools with um, deepening community-based partnerships to really tackle wider determinants. And they have a global initiative of the 100 million healthier lives by 2020 uh, with the support of many organisations. So again, a lot of material resources on their website, which I think is very valuable. And of course, as I say, they'll be familiar to you. Um, and they've been doing quite a lot of work on how best uh, to measure change, measure the metrics that matter, and they've got a very interesting guide to measuring the triple aim, which could be useful to you in thinking about population health. Another interesting set of resources that you might want to look at is something uh, a big, the biggest, one of the biggest health foundations in the 
a United States called Robert Woods Johnson Foundation, and they've really orientated all their work to try to improve what's called a culture of health, working through a, lot, a range of organisations to improve, uh, act on the wider determinants of health. Multi-year collaborative effort to work with certain uh, areas, and uh, again, using quality improvement techniques, identifying action groups, action population segments, action areas, uh, working out what are the drivers for ill health, the measures, but fundamentally working with the populations concerned. And the um, board of Robert Woods Johnson went up to see the Scottish Early Years Collaborative last year with, with as I say, with great effect. Derek Feely, who you saw in that film, took them over. Um, you will all, may, many of you will know about Kaiser Permanente, don't roll your eyes, I mean, they're always mentioned, but they are also doing very, very active work to improve population health um, and um, with, with, again, with some effect, but based on the kinds of tools that I've mentioned earlier. Kaiser Permanente do not take the poorest decile of patients, it must be said, though, they don't take Medicaid patients, so they're working with a, a higher end in, in, in terms of socioeconomic uh, spectrum than you will see. But nevertheless, really interesting, and again, a lot of tools online available for you to look at. And I haven't mentioned, of course, Yongshaping, which really probably has the, the, the longest pedigree. This is a, a county council in Sweden that's worked for over 20 years to improve population health. Again, using the kinds of approaches that I've mentioned, blended approach, multi-agency partnerships, strongly led, facilitative leadership, non-combative, talking, metrics, drivers, risk stratification, all those kinds of tools uh, with effect. And they're very open, they hold visits and are very uh, open to, uh, to sharing information. So finally, um, I think the answer to Amar's question, how do you begin on this, I don't think there's any rocket science here. I don't think there's any fairy dust. I really do think that it's kind of basic and it's the kinds of things that you've been doing already and uh, you're in a, you've got a very strong platform to move forward. Um, what kind of ingredients are, you know, s s I think, I can't think that they're more difficult, well, they are difficult, but they are straightforward, I think, in a sense. Identify who you are wanting to uh, effect, what you're wanting to work with, who you want to work with, what are your aims and objectives, try and keep these manageable, don't bore the ocean, identify your key stakeholders, in particular not forgetting um, the population groups themselves, um, local government, public health, whoever, in detail agree the priority areas, logic models, all these things, I don't even read them out because you'll, you'll be doing these anyway, mobilise support, I think data is pretty crucial. Without the data, you're not actually going to be able to identify your populations very well at, at risk. And do small tests of change and iteration, continuous learning, all the stuff you do, um, and um, develop your leadership capacity working with these multi-stakeholders groups over time. Um, so in conclusion, I mean, if you thought that quality improvement in healthcare is hard enough, and it is, I do think um, improving population health is a far bigger challenge, but that's where the prize is. Uh, going back to my first slide, you can see how much it is needed. What impacts on health is clearly highly complex, as we know, and a wide blend of approaches is the most important to use. There is a room for an, a systematic approach of the type that you've been using and trying to start small, but the good thing is there's huge amount of motivation to work on this agenda within the health service and particularly amongst patients as well and populations. And also there has been some significant progress and I do point to some areas. Um, 20 years ago we had one of the worst teen pregnancy uh, uh, rates, the highest rates in Europe. And I remember being working in government at that time and everybody thought it was far too difficult, but no, we, th there was a strategy developed. Two decades later, teenage pregnancies uh, have halved in Britain. Uh, and you can imagine the multiple factors there that were, that, 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 were, that were involved, but surely enough, they came down. So it is possible, and, um, and I think with goodwill and a systematic approach, and the leadership that you've got here, then I think you've got every great platform to make some progress. Thank you very much. Do you have time for a question? Do you have time for a question? Mm. 
So we have time for uh, a question or two for Jennifer. So, um, so Duncan and I are, are going to have a mic each, and if, if anyone wants to pose a question to Jennifer, feel free to put your hand up and we'll give you the mic. So what um, did you find interesting? Do you want to head over to Graham over there? No, hello, should I just, oh, great. Hi, thanks ever so much for a really fascinating talk and a really, really helpful um, thoughts. Um, in ELFT, we're looking at a lot of this population health. Um, we're about to um, have a massive improvement to our data visualization over the next couple of months, we're hoping. Um, but one of the things that we're coming up against are IG issues. Um, so as we look at, for example, answering questions like, um, how do people move through the healthcare system, not just in ELFT, but wider? Um, how do people, um, how does our efforts in one part of healthcare in, impact on other areas in healthcare? Um, we've got the databases there, but we can't get at them yeah. um, through NHSI or NHS Digital or through our local resources because of IG challenges. It's not a problem that's going to get solved tomorrow, but it's just an urging to the CEOs in the room and other um, senior leaders um, that although Facebook has managed to mess it up for all of us in terms of data privacy, um, there are legitimate reasons why we'd want to look at wider population indexes and answering some very, very simple questions are coming up against um, regulations that we can't get around at the moment. It's a massive issue. I'm so glad you mentioned it. We suffer as well at the foundation because we've been trying to join DWP uh, Department of Work and Pensions data with NHS data for ages. Even getting stuff out of NHS Digital is difficult. Um, so I don't have the answer to that because I don't hold any power in that direction, but I'm constantly a thorn in everyone's side when I do meet them, believe me. If you think about it, it's, it's, uh, it is one of our biggest, uh, apart from the staff, the data is an enormous, unique global asset. Nobody else has got anything like this data. Cradle to grave, multi-agency, you can just do fantastic work to track, um, not just um, to understand as well as to track it, the, evaluate the improvements. So anyway, so I just feel your pain is what I want to say. <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. One last question here. I just wondering if you could let me know your three priorities from the Health Foundation moving forward for the next five years. In this area. Yeah, that's a good point. So um, thank you for asking. Um, I think one of the things, because um, we, we do QI, but we also do a lot of policy-facing work. And I think there's a, big, there's a big effort to change the conversation at the national level that health isn't something, isn't a luxury that you, you pay for when you can afford it, when the economy's good. But it, it's actually an asset without which you don't have a flourishing society or indeed an economy, a productive economy. You know, we've got productivity, huge problems with productivity. We've got full employment. If, even if you just look at it through an economic lens, you have got to invest in the, in the health. Showing that return on investment and showing the impact of health on the economy is, we think, a big, big thing that we're going to do. So that's one big thing, changing the conversation to try and unlock more resources for public health. For, for that, that's number one. Um, number two, we uh, see a lot of uh, bodies around the place, um, uh, meaning organisations, uh, that are trying to work to improve public health, but they're kind of fragmented and scattered. So we think there's room for a collaboration. So we are funding a, a, a collaboration on, uh, on health. And then the other areas I mentioned here is using the, if you think about the NHS, is Europe's biggest industry. Um, how do we use those assets to mobilise those with others, whether they are private industry or with um, local community uh, groups or with government, to mobilise those assets more fully to get change in a community on wider determinants, to use the heft of the NHS as an employer, as an asset owner, as an uh, educator, um, so those three areas, I think. I know that sounds a bit sort of highfalutin. What we haven't, final word, what we haven't worked out yet is how we best fund things on the ground, um, this fund projects on the ground. So we will turn to that. But we want to orientate ourselves in those first three areas first. So Jennifer, you've set out the challenge for us uh, and you've given us some ideas and some examples that give us some encouragement. So thanks very much for setting the context for the day for us. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for asking me. Good luck.